K. Boyer suggested a comparison between the Pentium D and the Pentium Dual Core, so let's do it. Now, the Pentium Dual Core is essentially a Celeron version of the Core 2 Duo. The one I have here is two years newer than the Pentium D, but if anything, it will show how much technology has advanced in such a short amount of time. As you can see here, the Pentium D is clocked nearly 1 GHz faster than the Dual Core, as well as having double the L2 cache. Now, for those that are unaware, the Pentium D is just two Pentium 4 dies on a single chip. While this sounds good, it didn't quite work out that way. The Pentium Ds were known for using far more power and running very hot. The Pentium Dual Cores and Core 2 Duos were designed using two processing cores within a single die. Now, any communication the Pentium D had to do between the dies had to be done over the motherboard's front side bus. Those instructions had to leave the CPU, travel across the board, and back in again. The core architecture, which was used in the Dual Core and Core 2 Duos, allowed that communication to be done within the die itself, which was much faster and far more efficient. Not to mention the core CPUs used far less power and therefore ran cooler. Now, this Pentium Dual Core CPU, being a couple years newer, also incorporated an additional instruction set as well as being based on 45 nanometer technology rather than 65. Passmark shows the dual core scoring 244 points higher, and although some tests were close, the dual core pulled ahead on all. Remember, this CPU uses less power, is clocked lower, yet it still pulls ahead. The Passmark memory tests were a similar story, with the overall score being nearly identical. Our 7-zip test shows the dual core pulling ahead by finishing nearly a minute and a half sooner. By the way, I am aware of 7-zip having its own built-in benchmark. But when I can, I'd rather do a real benchmark than simulated. With video encoding, the dual core pulled far ahead of the D, encoding two full FPS higher and finishing 35 minutes sooner. In Cinebench 20, the D also fell behind by about 10 minutes and scored about 100 points lower than the dual core. Heaven also showed the D falling behind by nearly 3 FPS and scoring 35 points lower. The Superposition benchmark was much closer with even the min, max, and average FPS showing similar numbers, oddly enough with the D's frame rate being much smoother. GTA San Andreas was either 2-4 to four years old depending on the CPU, but it was definitely something that might have been still in played on either one of these. The dual core shows a higher FPS in all scenes. The D, you'll notice, shows no CPU temp, but trust me, it's very toasty throughout all these tests. The dual core, as you notice, often keeps temps in the low 30s. With GTA 4, as usual, here are the settings I use. Again, I know I'll get a higher frame rate it by making changes, but this is more about how everything compares using the same settings. Already, just standing outside on the street shows the dual core often rendering nearly 10 FPS higher. While driving around, neither were great, but the dual core is much smoother and definitely somewhat playable. The Pentium D just makes me want to jam the keys every time I need to turn or do anything because there's such a, a delayed control response. The dual core, although again not great, was playable. The GTA 4 benchmark shows the dual core scoring about 5 FPS higher than the D. I tested each using a 1080 30fps YouTube video in a browser with all hardware acceleration disabled. The dual core handled the 1080 30 test without many drop frames, while the D did nothing but drop frames and freeze up. At 480 30 though, both played fine. For the charts, as you know, I like to add an additional CPU for context. This time I added a Core 2 Duo E4500 at 2.2 GHz. 
This CPU was actually from a previous generation to the E5200. Even though it's an older chip, we can actually see a few interesting things. One is that the cheaper low-end dual core could actually pull ahead of a similarly clocked Core 2 Duo from the previous generation. Another is that at stock speeds, the nearly one gigahertz higher clock Pentium D fell behind everything. But I hear you say, what about overclocking the D? Yes, we could overclock them all, but the cores would win no doubt. So what about just overclocking the Pentium D? The board I'm using has very limited options for overclocking, so increasing the core voltage wasn't an option. The highest I could get it to run somewhat reliably was at 3.94 gigahertz, so essentially four gigahertz. Will this be enough to allow it to close the gap or even pull ahead? In Passmark, the CPU test showed it pulled ahead of its stock counterpart, but it's still 93 points shy of matching the dual core. In Passmark memory, it pulled ahead of both. However, it's a memory overclock, so that's not really surprising. Cinnabon showed the 4 GHz D definitely ran faster, but it was still far from coming close to the dual core. And again, remember that the Pentium dual core at this time was the low cost or the Celeron version of the Core 2 Duo, and it still owned the D. In superposition, the overclock D only did slightly better than at stock speeds, only scoring 0.02 average FPS higher. The GTA 4 benchmark also showed it pulled ahead of its stock speeds, but it's still slower than the dual core. Now, I ran many other benchmarks without actually showing them here, but they are displayed on the graph. Handbrake wouldn't run at this speed and would usually lock up around 75% of the way through, so I didn't include that. However, all results are what you'd expect. The overclock D is somewhere between the stock D and the others. What was interesting is 7-zip. It compressed at a much higher average speed and blew away the rest. I'm not sure why this is, however, it could have something to do with the larger amount of independent cache per die and higher front side bus speeds. But when you see how it really came alive with just a 600 megahertz overclock when compared to its stock speeds, it's just mind boggling. Now I did run that test multiple times and even went back to stock speeds just to test it out again and sure enough, these were the average scores. If anyone has a better idea as to why this is, please leave it in the comments down below. And as usual, if you made it this far, I want to say thank you and let me know what you think down below. Also, any other ideas that you have or any other things that you want to see benchmarked, let me know and I'll see what I can do. Well, until next time. Bye-bye.